In today's episode, we arrive at Exodus chapter 6. Moses is distraught. His first appeal to Pharaoh to let the people go appears to backfire. Pharaoh retaliated by making work harder for the Hebrews, who then turned against Moses, who then questioned God's plans. But in his mercy, God reaffirms his promise of deliverance and sends Moses and Aaron back to Pharaoh. Good morning. Today is Tuesday, November 15th, and you're listening to Thy Strong Word. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo of St. John Lutheran Church in Laverne, Minnesota. Thy Strong Word is underwritten by the Lutheran Heritage Foundation. Learn more about them at lhfmissions.org. Well, joining us this morning to discuss Exodus chapter 6, please join me in welcoming back my guest, the Reverend John Shank, pastor of Trinity Lutheran Church in Edwardsville, Illinois. Pastor Shank, good morning and welcome back to the program. Well, good morning. God's blessings to you today. It's always a, a blessing. It's always a great honor to be on uh, KFUO and, and be on with you studying God's Word, especially this chapter, which which does. It does speak to us about God's God's answer in the midst of our doubt, in the midst of the circumstances uh, of life and which, uh, what we see is maybe sickness, uh, circumstances of, of struggle, the hard road we are called to walk as believers in, in our Lord, uh, and, and yet he brings us back to his promise um, once uh, time and time again. Yeah, and we're so grateful to him for that, and we're grateful for you too. We also have a little bit of a genealogy lesson today, so that should be interesting. But before we get into that, speaking of life's events, how has life and ministry been for you since we've last talked? It's been a little while. Yeah, it's uh, been a month, and uh, in that month, there's lots of things going on for us. This weekend, this weekend, our church, it's our church's turn to have sausage supper. So I don't know if the churches in your area do sausage <laughs> supper, but every one of the churches in our area pretty much does a, a sausage supper. And this weekend is Trinity's turn. So uh, come over. If you're in the area, come to Trinity <laughs> this weekend for uh, some sausage and a uh, wonderful meal. Um, those kind of things are happening for us personally. We've got some sick ones at home today, so I'm Aww. I'm ministering to them while uh, telling them to be quiet for a little bit while I'm on the radio. Um, yeah, yeah, lots of stuff happening. Well, if they have any insight, feel free to put them on. Uh, today's a <laughs> special day for me, too. Today is my son's 15th birthday, so that's making me feel pretty old today. I can't believe I have a 15-year-old who's going to be learning to drive and soon will need a car. So hopefully the used car prices go down before we have to buy him something. We're, we're feeling that too. We have a, a <laughs> freshman this year and he'll be starting to do all those kind of things real soon. So yeah, oh. Lord, help us out with those gas, <laughs> gas prices and uh, insurance and car, all the rest. Yeah. Exactly. I think we'll be pleading to uh, the Lord, just like Moses did, maybe complaining even a little bit. <laughs> but And that's what's interesting about our text today. You know, Moses, in the last chapter, he really kind of, I don't want to say he turned on the Lord, but in a very sort of Job at his breaking point kind of way, was like, Lord, this is not working out. And we're going to get into that today. Uh, but let's start by uh, some prayer, of course. Would you lead us in some prayer? Yeah, let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord God, we cry to you, for in the midst of our lives we are, are filled with, with only things that our eyes see and, and ears hear of struggle and the hardships of, of this life, the heavy weight of, of living in a fallen world where the burdens are real and the struggles are amazingly heavy, and we don't we don't know how we can get through them. And yet in the midst of all that, we we forget that you are with us. You are the one who carries us. We are not the ones who bring us through this life. You are the one who brings us through this life. All by the powerful working of your son. Remind us of that truth. Remind us of your promise. Remind us of who you are and what you do all through your son, our Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. So our text for today is pretty much broken into two major sections, and the one at the very beginning, 6, 1 through, oh, about halfway through, that is uh, going to be the, really a continuation of what was happening in chapter 5. Before we read the text, 
Would you like to set the stage at all for what we're going to hear? Yes, please. Um, so as you started off uh, for the day, you know, if people have been tracking along, but even if they haven't, they've, they've uh, learned the lessons that came before from Sunday school where the Lord calls Moses. Uh, Moses is in the, you know, in the, the wilderness tending to the sheep and then sees the burning bush. God calls him, gives him his name and tells him what he's going to do. He is sending him to Pharaoh uh, to tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And so he does. Uh, but this first interaction with Pharaoh did not go so well, right? He goes to him and, and he tells him that, you know, let, let God's people go. Uh, the Lord declares, let my people go. And his first uh, call to let uh, the people of God go was for three days in the wilderness to worship, um, to to feast. Um, he goes back and tells them to, to sacrifice. And, and Pharaoh's response is, who is the Lord? Who is this guy? Yep. I, I don't know him. And which reveals the very heart of Pharaoh that he does not know the Lord, the one true God. He is not uh, a believer at all. He uh um, he does not know him, which um, we can't even fully plumb the depths of humanity's fall into sin in that kind of statement. I don't, I don't know him. Therefore, he's not going to let Israel go. And it, it turns from bad to worse, right? Um, because then Pharaoh takes this opportunity to make life even harder for God's people under, under slavery. So he turns to the taskmasters and tells them, oh, well, this people, they, they must... They must want to to be unburdened because because of idleness, right? If right. they were working harder, they wouldn't be thinking about what am I going to do with my free time? Let's not give them any free time. Uh, therefore, no, not only do they have to make the bricks, but they have to get the straw for the bricks that we demand that they make. And and by the way, don't don't lower the number that they need to do. So now they have to get the straw. They must make the bricks and they have to keep up with the same amount. So um, the people, the people of, of Israel, the Hebrews, they, they turn to, to Moses and Aaron and they blame them. Uh, it's, it's their fault. They have uh, made Pharaoh mad. They have made uh, them, the people, a stench to Pharaoh, and now he has become angry. And it ends with this, right, with with Moses turning to the Lord and saying, Oh, Lord, why have you done evil to the people? Why do you ever send me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people, and you have not delivered your people at all. <laughs> and that is how the chapter ends. So I, I think that really reflects um, the mindset, the spiritual struggle of Pharaoh, of, Pharaoh, of Moses, uh, and why um, why this why this is such a powerful uh, chapter for the life for our life as God's people too, because we we might have those same kind of thoughts and struggles in the midst of our lives. We have God's promise, and, and yet when we look around in the world, we have we have great hardships and, uh, you know, you know, in midst of days of sicknesses, yes, but you know, I've got, I've got, uh, members and you have members. We, we have brothers and sisters in Christ that have great struggle of, of loss, you know, loss of family members, uh, hardships and, uh, and weight that seems beyond what they could, could bear. And they're, they're wondering, is God, has God forgotten them? And this chapter reminds us of, of the fact that he has not forgotten his promise um, and his love for his people um, endures forever. You know, I'm of two minds when I hear Moses kind of lashing out at God, maybe three minds, because one, it draws me back to the, to the, to the, to the garden. And we have the fall into sin and all the sort of the blaming that's going back and forth. Adam blames Eve, but ultimately he blames God, right? That woman that you gave to be with me. And then God turns to Eve and she says, nope, it was the serpent. And God turns to the serpent. And then, of course, he explains the consequences going backwards to Adam. What we have here, you know, Moses does what God tells him to do. Uh, he doesn't like the results. The people don't like the results. So the people blame Moses. Moses blames God. 
But in God's defense, not that he needs it from me, but in God's defense, way back in Exodus chapter 3, uh, verse 19, when God gives him this you know, commission to go, he tells him. He says in verse 19, but I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. So one thing that's been striking to me as we've been going through these verses is that Moses knows that every time he approaches Pharaoh, now he's just done it once so far, but every time he approaches Pharaoh, it's not going to work. It will eventually work in God's good timing, according to God's good plan, but God is sending him on a mission that essentially is building up to the result, but Moses can only really see you know, what's in front of him, and that's why he's so frustrated. So the other mind that I have then, the third mind, is that, you know, I, as you point out, sometimes I feel like Moses, though. I feel like, you know, sort of yelling out saying, Lord, you know, why have you done this? Why did you ever send me? You know, for since I came to Pharaoh, things have gotten worse. And we think about the ways in which God wants us to live. We think about the commandments, which are coming up, you know, in a few chapters. And we think about, you know, when I live the way that God has designed for us to live, do things go better? Are we blessed? And the answer is yes. But at the same time, because the way God wants us to live is at such enmity with the world and the way it wants us to live, then we also face more persecutions. So it's sort of a double-edged sword. So the more that you're like, say, in business and you say, I'm not going to lie, I'm not going to cheat, I'm not going to steal, but you live in, let's say, a, in a very secular business where those things are commonplace, you might say, well, Lord, I can't get ahead unless I act like everybody else. And that's just a small example. There's all kinds. The reason I use that example is because when I was a private investigator, a lot of my job couldn't be done if I didn't regularly break at least two or three of the commandments on a regular basis. And so, you know, I find myself going, <laughs> Lord, I don't know how to fit this in with my Christian vocation. Uh, and, uh, I could never figure it out. People say, well, how did you solve it? Oh, I just quit and went to seminary. So I, I don't know that I, <laughs> I, I don't know that I have a ton of advice for people who are in that same situation, but, but it's still yeah. the truth. You know, we look at God and we say, we say, Lord, we want to live the way you want us to live, but we're at odds with our own natures and with the world and everything else. And so we can get frustrated with God, but thankfully God, you know, he doesn't smite us as we deserve. Just like with, with, uh, Moses, he, he doubles down on his mercy. Yes, it does. And, you know, you, you pointed out um, an example within the world. And, and I think Moses, he does, you know, if you're ever wondering what's going on, you know, during the week, what does my pastor think? We'll just read about Moses, right? And Moses mm -hmm. will kind of show you the insight of what's going on in your pastor's mind and in your pastor's heart, right? Lord, you sent me to these people, and I think I've made it worse. I don't, <laughs> I don't know if I've really helped. I, I don't know what I'm doing here. Um, and uh, and maybe that's also reflecting, you know, in a fa I'm also a father in a father's heart, right? Lord, you yeah. gave me these kids, and I'm supposed to care for them, but Lord, I can see all my failures, and I'm sure that's also true. I'm not a mother, but I would assume that's that's true there too, where we see our our sins are always before us, and we we know what we should be doing, and and yet we always are reminded of our of our frailties and our sins, and, and yet the Lord uh, the Lord is faithful to His promises. Um, so often we think, well, how is anything good? At going to be good going to come from the the work uh that i have uh and the lord has called me to do because i am um and we'll get it coming up you know as we go through this chapter i'm, I'm a man of unclean lips and you might say i'm a you know the listener might say i'm a woman of unclean lips I, I am a sinful person how can god use me and and we're we're forgetting something that we'll need to point out in this chapter and it's pretty significant when we forget it um, about how God how God works and who is at work. Um, so yeah, I, I think this chapter is very powerful in, in, in many in many respects, um, but uh, powerfully reminding us of His presence and His action even in the midst of our of our lack, you know, a lack of seeing what's what's going on. Because you know Moses in the chapter before he's he's only seeing what um, what he can. And what he can right. see is a sense of failure. You know, I told I told Moses what he told me to tell him, and and he didn't listen. In fact, it made it worse. So maybe I shouldn't talk anymore, God. Maybe I shouldn't say it. And he's forgetting what God has called him to do. 
And well, we remember that so, Moses already tried to get out of it, right? He already yeah. gave plenty of excuses. And so he probably— I've got lots of excuses, yeah. Yeah, and I don't want to put words in the Bible for sure or even into uh, Moses' head, but I also imagine him thinking, well, I told you I wasn't going to be good at this. Right, right. And what he's missing is how God is going— how God is still at work, and he's actually using what what Moses thinks is a failure is— is the means by which he's going to deliver, which we hear yeah. right at the very beginning. Well, why don't we get into that very beginning? So we we have just ended chapter five with Moses basically saying, you know what, Lord, you said you would deliver the people and you have not delivered your people at all. Here, verses one through 13 of chapter six from the ESV. But the Lord said to Moses, now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh, for with a strong hand, he will send them out and with a strong hand he will drive them out of his land. God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am Yahweh. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, Yahweh, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they lived as sojourners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the people of Israel, whom the Egyptians hold as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am Yahweh, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God. And you shall know that I am Yahweh, your God, who has brought you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And I will give it to you for a possession. I am Yahweh. Moses spoke thus to the people of Israel, but they did not listen to Moses because of their broken spirit and harsh slavery. So Yahweh said to Moses, Go in, tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the people of Israel go out of his land. But Moses said to Yahweh, Behold, the people of Israel have not listened to me. How then shall Pharaoh listen to me? For I am of uncircumcised lips. But Yahweh spoke to Moses and Aaron and gave them a charge about the people of Israel and about Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, to bring the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt. All right, thus endeth our text. So, yeah, he says right away, you're going to see. You just watch. Not only is he going to let them go, he's going to drive them away. He's going to be he's going to be wanting to be rid of them by the time I'm done with him. And of course, we know the end. But yeah, that's it's exciting to hear the Lord say that. Yep. Yeah, uh, as uh, as we know, pronouns are pretty important. So as we start off from the beginning, <laughs> uh, God gives to to Moses what he needs to hear. Right. That this is God is still at work even in this. Even here, as Pharaoh rejects the word, God is still in control, and he's going to use this to to do to Pharaoh what he needs to do. Um, and so he's he then turns, and, and it could easily be missed. Um, for with a strong hand, he will send them out, and with a strong hand, he will drive them out of his land. So how is God going to deliver his people? Through what instrument? And our first response would be thinking, well, uh, Moses. And that's true. God is going to use Moses and Aaron, but he's also going to use Pharaoh. He's going to use Pharaoh to deliver his own people. Like you said, by the end, he's going to say, you know, Pharaoh will be the one to say, you need to go. You have I'm going to gonna, I'm gonna free the people of Israel and <laughs> yes. Pharaoh is going to pay for it. Yeah. And yeah. And not only that, yes. And the, he's going to pay for it too. Yeah, he's going to pay, yeah. uh, you know, he's going to, he's going to give the means by which, you know, I will be worshiped. Uh, oh. So yeah, this is uh God, God is kind of showing off how much he's in control. Um, and it's exactly what Moses needs to hear. And it's what we need to hear too. The, the, the things that we think are, are proving to us why God is not in control are actually a means by which God is showing he is in control. And he is, um, he's, he is completely in the driver's seat here, Moses. And we need to be reminded of that too, of course. And, you know, I, and I, I don't want to jump ahead. And by jump ahead, I mean jump ahead to, you know, chapter 12. But I don't want to jump ahead. But I feel like God's also working within the temperament of the Pharaoh. So, for instance, 
every time God, and I know in the plagues coming up, God's going to be getting glory, showing his power over the various gods of Egypt and, of course, including Pharaoh. But every time Pharaoh refuses to let the people go, I mean, he wavers a couple times, but he refuses to let the people go. He doesn't, I don't even know that it's that he doesn't know who Yahweh is, um, but he just thinks that this is a pretty pathetic God because as, as I said before, and we'll say again, you know, gods of this time were understood to be as powerful as the people who adopted them. So if you're a God of people who are in slavery, well, then you're obviously not a very powerful God. Pharaoh has plenty of room on his uh, polytheistic shelf for Yahweh, but it's going to be way at the bottom. So he's kind of mocking God. And he says, I don't even know who this Yahweh guy is. Either he literally didn't know or he's just being mocking in that, you know, well, who's he compared to Osiris and Ra and all the others? And so uh, I think that by the time that, you know, God is ready to release the people, he's made it such that even the Pharaoh, who never is going to come around, thinks it's his idea. <laughs> now, we know what happens. It's this, this the, the, the plague of death. And, you know, I always imagine Pharaoh holding his son in his own arms, just trying to say, get rid of them all. But still. Pharaoh feels like it's his decision at the end, and yet ultimately it was it was God the whole time. So in both cases, Moses, you don't have to go at it alone. I'm with you. Pharaoh, you want to be in charge? Fine, but you're still going to make the decision I want you to make. Now, I'm not trying to be fatalistic. I'm just trying to say that God is in control. Yeah, and, and that it, isn't that the a constant cycle of, of sin, right, where it's uh, sin and fallen man and the devil think they're in so much trouble, right? Take that all the way to the salvation of mankind, where the devil's constant thought is, I'm going to kill this one. I'm going to, you know, we see it in Revelation, the dragon desires to eat up, gobble up um, the son, uh, this child. And, and, it, and, it, and by doing uh, by doing what he desires uh, humanity to do, to to punish, uh, to to whip and beat and uh, scourge, and then crucify Jesus, <laughs> it is the very means by which yeah. Christ wins, and and uh, death is destroyed by death. So yeah, this is uh, Pharaoh is a, a a type of fallen man, is a type of of even the you know the devil himself, which um, thinks that he is in control. And, and, and the whole time, God is, is laughing at humanity to think that you are in control of, of him or that we could challenge his authority or his reign or his rule. Um, God, is going to, um, God is going to do what he uh, set out to do. And yes, uh, Pharaoh might think he is, uh, he is in control, but um, he, is, <laughs> he is far from it. Let's talk a little bit about verses two and three. You know, God spoke to Moses and said, I am Yahweh. In your English Bibles, folks at home, it usually says Lord, all caps. We've covered this before, but really here written is the name of God, Yahweh. And he says, I am Yahweh. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as um, El Shaddai, which we render as God Almighty, even though uh, we don't know. But by my name, Yahweh, I did not make myself known to them. But, brother, we read the name Yahweh even in Genesis. So right. what do you think is going on here? Yeah, I think, you know, I think there is a connection here with, you know, you said, well, did Pharaoh not know that Israelites have this separate God? Or may maybe in his arrogance he didn't care, and maybe it's just because— they're slaves, so who cares about a slave god or whatever? Um, and even here, then, with the Israelites, um, as as humanity, we need God to reveal Himself. And as He reveals Himself, there is this ongoing revelation. Not that not that Israel didn't know God, um, but He is He is going forth um, with a further revelation of of who he is and what he does. So who God is and what God does always goes together. Um, and, and so, you know, that Jesus uh, is, is the name by which we, we call on the second person of the Trinity in the, in the, in the incarnation uh, of God and man in one person, and that the, the Lord uh, saves. Um, he is our deliverer. 
that is his name, but also that is who he, who, what he does. Um, so I think that there is a lot going on here with, uh, with the revelation of God's name and what comes in these uh, next few verses of, of what God does for the people and that they are being brought to see, yes, he is, I am, he is the one who is, he is the constant one. Um, but this constant one, this constant present one, that one that is beyond time, uh, the creator and uh, sustainer of all things is the one who has personally come to um, to deliver us. So uh, Abraham might not have fully understood that, uh, that he is also a deliverer um, because he, he um, yeah, he didn't have the fullness of, of the knowledge of, the, of what his descendants would go through. And um, yeah, so I, it's not that he, not that Abraham didn't know God or he wasn't a believer or anything like that, or didn't have that name because he did have the name, but the name and uh, the saving actions of God do go together. And that's part of a, an ongoing revelation that brings us all the way to the cross. And we see this with the disciples. They know who Jesus is, but then we have to say that, you know, kind of, because then really the fullness of the revelation brings us to the cross. So they can't say they fully understand who Jesus is until Jesus is lifted up and draws all people to himself. And then even there doesn't really fully understand what all this means until the day of Pentecost. So um, I think all of that connects together. I agree with you. This is the, the, probably the best way to understand this. The reason I pointed out is because some people want to make, hey, critics of the Bible will yeah, say, yeah. Well, here we have Yahweh's name being revealed to his people, and we hear Moses using Yahweh's name earlier. Well, a couple of things to remember. This isn't being written in real time. It's being written after the fact. So if you're reading about Yahweh in Genesis, it's just as possible that Mo Moses is editorializing it, or even the scribes, by inserting Yahweh's name in the places where it's appropriate, because by the time it is recorded, everybody knows Yahweh's name. And this is the first time he actually reveals the name, the Tetragrammaton, which is Yahweh. On the other hand, perhaps Yahweh was as a name known to them, but you illustrate, and I think rightly, you know, that name, just like when we teach a uh, confirmance, we give them the language first. That's why we have the memorization. And then we build up meaning into what those words mean as they grow older. So if you're saying, well, I don't want to teach my three-year-old how to say the Lord's Prayer because he's not going to understand what those words mean, that's true, but teach it anyway because then he'll have the tools and the language that we can then fill in with meaning as he grows older. Same here. God could have very well revealed his name to them, but it wasn't until this point that what Yahweh means and everything that is built into who he was in his redemptive plan makes its you know makes its revelation to them where they actually get oh that's why we call him Yahweh or that's what God is doing for us. So yeah, I mean and, and it could be argued a couple different ways, but what you point out is the most important thing is that that God reveals himself to us in the time that we need it and not all at once because uh, well frankly we couldn't handle it. Yeah. Yeah. I uh yeah, and for for the people then uh, and for Moses, again, I think five and chapters five and six really do build each other. So Moses is receiving from the Lord exactly what he needed to hear. And, and that continues on with the next few verses about um, what he will do and the words that he is supposed to then bring of deliverance to the people. Well, we'll get to those next few verses in just a few moments, because right now it's time for a break. So folks, when we come back, Pastor Shank and I will keep going with Exodus chapter 6. We'll see you on the other side. These are the voices of young Lutherans in Mexico City, children who are excited to learn more about their Savior, Jesus. But they need our help, because good Lutheran books for kids in the Spanish language are in short supply in Mexico. To learn how you can help tell Spanish-speaking kids everywhere about Jesus in a language they can understand, 
go to the Lutheran Heritage Foundation website at lhfmissions.org forward slash Juan 316. Welcome back to Thy Strong Word. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boom. With me today is the Reverend John Shank, pastor of Trinity Lutheran Church in Edwardsville, Illinois. Now remember, if you have questions or comments about today's show, feel free to direct them to me at pastorboo at gmail.com. Now, Pastor, before the break, we had just made our way to verse 4 in our chapter 6, so we probably should make some make some time. We don't want to be cramming in all of the genealogy there in the last few minutes. But um, we have God now. He's made his name known to them. He now recalls his covenant. Start there and, and, and take us through. Yeah, so he's calling Moses again. Moses is filled with doubts. You know, uh, well, God, what you know, what does what does this rejection of the word mean? And so God brings him back, brings him back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and now he is reminding him that he has made a promise and he's going to keep that promise. Um, and then he goes through all these um, sayings in the next oh few verses up to what verse. Uh, nine or so, uh, where he keeps saying, you know, I will, you know, I will deliver them and I will redeem them and I will take them to be my people and I will be your God and I will bring them into the land that I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and I will give uh, it to them as a possession. I will be, I am the Lord. So he's reminding them, uh, reminding Moses of who he is. Uh, because this is uh, this is like a common struggle. Well, it's a common struggle for us all, but we see it uh, constantly in the example of Moses, where Moses is looking at what he can do, um, and he's looking at um, what's going on around him, and what God wants Moses to do, and what God wants us to do is look to to Him. So it's it's the wrong fo- we we continue to have throughout this chapter the wrong the wrong focus. You're looking at the wrong thing, Moses. You're looking at the wrong one. You're looking at uh, at Pharaoh and the might of Pharaoh and the, the will of Pharaoh. You're looking at the people and their opposition and their anger towards you. And you're, you're missing someone. You're, you're forgetting me. You're forgetting God. You're forgetting Yahweh and God's promise uh, to deliver. And so he, and Moses, in this, this great time of distress, and he needs to hear the promise, which, which helps us. You know, when when our brothers and sisters are in times of great distress, we're we're not to chastise them. Or, he, he doesn't take Moses out and says, you know, you stiff neck Moses. <laughs> you know, you're filled with sin. Look at all your doubts. How can I ever use you? Or he doesn't say that. He's like. He brings him back to his promise. And when we have people that are struggling, we, we don't, you know, beat them up in their sins. We, this is the time where they need to hear of God's promise. Um, when they've already been broken uh, by the fallenness of this world, broken by their sins, and they're in great distress and despair, we, we need to preach to them the gospel, God's promise. Don't, don't point them back to themselves. Point them to the cross. Point them to the empty tomb. Point them to the fact that Jesus is returning and there's resurrection and life forevermore. And we need to point them to where they need to come. Come back. Come back to hear the promises. So if you've been away from the word, come into the word. Come to receive the word preached to you. If you've been away, come. Come and receive the gifts of Christ because you know that this way is difficult. It's too much. The Lord knows it's too much for you. That's why he wants to feed and sustain you. So here he's feeding and sustaining Moses because this way is too much for him. And he is feeding him and he's sustaining him in his promises. The I wills there, as you have pointed out, are so important for us to remember. Of course, the I will there isn't the us, as you say, it's God. And he doesn't even say, I counted them for what it's worth. I, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, there's seven. I kind of wish there were 10, but you know, whatever. So there are seven. <laughs> I will. Seven's a good number too. Yeah. You're right. You're right. Of course, seven's a good number. I meant to say, of course it's seven. No, I'm not reading too much into that, but we see the, <laughs> we see the I wills, but what we don't see is him saying, I will give you the ability to do this. I will give you all the tools you need to break free of Pharaoh. 
And in the same way, as you were saying, I was imagining a situation with a parishioner and telling them essentially what you were just speaking. And yeah, that's the distinction. You know, it isn't about equipping you to fight all your battles. It's about equipping you to rely more and more on God's promises each day. And that he says that he will deliver, he will do it. Well, yeah, what a wonderful message for people today, especially as I don't want to allegorize it, but as we look at the uh, the tyranny that Christians around the world face and the, let's say, obstruction that American Christians are facing increasingly more each day, we feel like, you know, again, not to connect ourselves to what they were enduring in Egypt, but we feel like we are under pharaohs. And so we're thinking of all these like, well, well how can I then counteract the pharaohs of this world? And the answer is rely on God, trust in him. You know, I preached uh, last, last uh, yesterday, a couple of days ago, and I preached and I said, listen, you know, whenever you're caught up in all of the, the drama and the stress that goes along with everything that's going on in the world, the first thing you need to do is stop. Just stop. Be in God's word. Hear his, his promises. Rely on them because we're wearing ourselves out trying to fight all these battles that God has already promised are fought and won. Yeah, and if you're a uh, three-year lectionary, you know, um, the, the reading from Luke 21 where the Lord uh, promises his disciples that they, they will be handed over. They, they will. Um, relatives, family members, uh, you know, f- uh, parents— um, and they will be brought before, and they they need to uh, decide in their minds, put it in their mind that they're not going to meditate beforehand because they have a word, right? The, the implication is they already have the word that the world cannot um, contradict. The world cannot stand opposed to it, and that's the word of the gospel. So we are just called to preach the gospel. Um, you know, there is a, a thought, you know, when we see these um, these texts where um, we're opposing uh, governmental forces um, to maybe get a little confused that that this is then the primary mission of the Christian church, this kind of liberation reality in which um, everything that the sinful world has out there that's oppressive and is wrong, that we need to stand opposed to it so that um, that's that's all that we do. That's all that we do. Um, uh, uh, the only thing that we do is uh, feed and clothe and um, look to end any kind of oppression. But the reality is we need to preach the gospel. And of course, the gospel changes uh, hearts and minds and lives. Um, but the, it's, it's the gospel that does it. Um, not the other way. If we do it the other way, where where we want to just end any kind of uh, struggle here, the the slavery of of Egypt. If we end the slavery, but we don't preach the gospel, they're still enslaved. They're still um, right. they're still bound. Um, but if we preach the gospel, and of course um, the world doesn't want us to preach the gospel because then it will have an effect on on people and where they will they will want to um, love their neighbor. Um, no, they won't do it perfectly, and and there is still much sin, and we still have uh, much to repent of, and the things that we leave left undone that we should have done. Uh, but uh, the primary focus here is what God is doing through His promise, would it, which does deliver us, not just from our earthly slavery, but from this eternal slavery uh, to death and and from sin and from devil. When you talk about uh, the church's role in culture, you know, it's not our primary mission to make the world a Christian utopia or our, even our country or even our neighborhood. The goal is to proclaim the gospel, and God takes care of the rest. You know, the world is set to be destroyed and renewed, um, not that we shouldn't take care of it and not that we shouldn't, you know, work to make our lives and our neighbor's lives better. That should always be in our mind. But we have to remember, as you pointed out, that is not the purpose of the church is just to take care of these means. A great book for those who are interested in that topic. It's a classic. It's not the perfect book, but it's uh, Christ and Culture by H. Richard Niebuhr. And he explores the role of the church and culture. And he lays out five options. You know, is it Christ against culture? Right. Is it Christ of culture where the church just looks at like the world? Is it Christ above culture? Christ uh, 
uh, in paradox with the culture, which unsurprisingly is the Lutheran position, or is it Christ as transformer of culture that, you know, the church is to be out there transforming culture. And we have to be very careful that we stay in our lane, not only because of our understanding of two kingdoms, but also because this is where God has put us. And this is where he's promised that there will be change. So the same thing with, with this situation, God has told him from the very beginning, 319, this is not going to happen until I do something about it. But he still sends him to him, you know, 10 times until God makes the, makes the thing happen. And so Moses isn't to be looking at this as some, you know, or we aren't to be looking at this as some template for how we fight the pharaohs of today. We're to be looking at this at how God has promised to redeem his people and how he keeps his promises. Amen to that. Because then here in verse 9, um, it's not just Moses, or sorry, it's not just Pharaoh and Moses too. It's not just Moses and Pharaoh that are the problem. Um, even the people are struggling, right? Um, because Moses spoke to the people of Israel, but they did not listen to Moses because of their broken spirit and their harsh slavery. So even after uh, God give, gave uh, Moses the, the word to speak, uh, he speaks it and they would not listen. And uh, it's frustrating, uh, you know. So, um, yeah, when we talk about what's what's uh, really at work here and who is the Lord really working in in the lives of here, if we just looked at uh, Pharaoh, we would be missing um, missing another point that that the Lord is working in the lives of His own people to bring them to faith. Then Moses in verse 12 asks what I think again is a reasonable question. Moses said to Yahweh, behold, the people of Israel have not listened to me. How's Pharaoh going to listen to me? Uh, for I am of uncircumcised lips. Interesting phrase there. You know, is that referring to his speech impediment? Is that referring to the fact that he's a foreigner uh, in the sight of even Pharaoh and Israel? Is it a little bit of both? But the point is, it's a reasonable from a human point of view because he's just looking at his experience. My experience is you told me to do this. I tried it a whole one time. It didn't work. <laughs> so, so I guess this is not going to work, even though God continually tells him it will work. You just have to give it time. And so there's a trust there that even Moses, right? Moses, we, I've said this before. We take the the, the saints of old, the patriarchs, we take their icons off the wall, we shake all the gold off of it, and we realize they're just regular people. And, yeah. you know, the, the glory of them is not in and of their perfection, which they don't have, but how God used them. So I, I actually love hearing sort of my own thoughts in Moses's head, even though they're sinful. You know, God, I, I've tried, uh, you know, so I guess that's it. And, and, of course, the Lord says, no, and I love it. And he gave them a charge. And the charge is the same thing. It's not new. The charge is go get the people out of Israel. You know, like, what are you staying around here for? Go get to work. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Cause, uh, <laughs> yeah, the, the, the thought of un uncircumcised lips. I mean, this is something we, we're going to hear throughout scripture, you know, unclean lips with, with, uh, Isaiah, and, you know, so, um, yeah, I, Maybe, like you said, maybe it has to do with his uh, personal struggle, but I think he's seeing his weakness, right? The the weakness of uh, of man. It's not going to be by man's eloquence. So even for us as pastors too, right? It's not our eloquence that converts uh, the unbeliever. You know, I am such a a powerful preacher. It's the word. It's the it's the gospel. Um, so if he's looking to himself, yeah, he's going to feel so inadequate. And he is. In, and so he doesn't say, no, 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 you're not inadequate. Look at all these great things. He just he's, he just he just tells him to go. Um, <laughs> he doesn't take away the thought that, yes, you are inadequate. Right. I, but <laughs> your your inadequacy is not going to get in my way, just like how Pharaoh's hard heart is not going to get in my way. I, the Lord, is going to accomplish his purposes, and he does it by his working, all by the powerful working of the Holy Spirit through the word. 
So in the times think- where we feel totally inadequate, I mean, I, this, this word definitely speaks to all of us that it's not, it's not, we're looking again at the wrong spot. We need to look to the sufficiency of, of the word. I'm pretty sure I've had bosses like that too. You bring them your concerns and they go, well, thank you for bringing that to my attention. Now go back to work. And (laughs) (laughs) of course the Lord has uh, good intentions. I tell you what, we have verses 14 through 29, no 30 through 30 to get through. A lot of this Mm -hmm. is genealogy though. And we're not going to dig into every aspect of the genealogy, but we should definitely hear it. Here we go. These are the heads of their father's houses. The sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, Hanok, Palu, Hezron, and Carmi. These are the clans of Reuben. The sons of Simeon, Jamuel, Jamin, Ohad, Jaquin, Sohar, and Shaul, the son of a Canaanite woman. These are the clans of Simeon. These are the names of the sons of Levi according to their generations, Gershon, Kohath, and Merari the years of the life of Levi being 137 years. The sons of Gershon, Libini, and Shemai, and their clans. The sons of Kohath, and Amron, Izhar, and Hebron, and Uziel, the years of the life of Kohath being 133 years. The sons of Merari, Mahali, and Mushi. These are the clans of the Levites according to their generations. Amram took as his wife Jochebed, his father's sister, and she bore him Aaron and Moses the years of the life of Amran being 137 years. The sons of Izhar, Korah, Nepheg, and Zekiri. The sons of Uziel, Mishael, uh, Elzaphan, Elzaphan, and Sithiri. Aaron took as his wife Elisheba, the daughter of Aminadab, and the sister of Nahashan, and she bore him Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. The sons of Korah, Asir, Elkanah, and Abiasaph. These are the clans of the Korites. Eleazar, Aaron's son, took as his wife one of the daughters of Putiel, and she bore him Phinehas. These are the heads of the fathers of the Levites by their clans. These are the Aaron and Moses, to whom the Lord said, Bring out the people of Israel from the land of Egypt by their hosts, It was they who spoke to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, about bringing out the people of Israel from Egypt, this Moses and this Aaron. On the day when the Lord spoke to Moses in the land of Egypt, the Lord said to Moses, I am Yahweh. Tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, all that I say to you. But Moses said to Yahweh, Behold, I am of uncircumcised lips. How will Pharaoh listen to me? Now, those last few verses really probably belong in the next chapter because it's it's shifting back to the narrative after giving us this uh, genealogy. Um, if you think that I pronounced any of the names wrong, you're feel free to email me at pastorvu at gmail.com. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, back You did back a wonderful to, job. <laughs> that uh, was not easy. Yeah. Well, that's the funny thing, right? Because, you know, you always have one or two who are experts at Hebrew going, no, that's not correct. But thankfully for us, right, Pastor <laughs> Wheat, as long as we say it with confidence, our people usually are okay with it. Yeah. Yeah, you did great. Yeah. That, anyway, what's, I, what's when we take a look, yeah, when we take a look at the genealogy, I think there's a few things to keep in mind here. One, um, keep in mind the greater context of the chapter. So, what's the greater context of the chapter? Um, Moses is in doubt of his calling. Moses is wondering, has God made a real? I mean, I don't. I I don't think. I hope I'm not going too far. He's almost wondering to the point: Has God made a mistake? Has God called the wrong person? Has you know? I'm I'm not the right guy, and this isn't working. I've only made things worse. God, what are you doing here? And so he brings him back um, to the greater promise of who he is within God's within God's uh, household of calling um, Israel to be His people. And so you've got um, Reuben and then Simeon, and then Levi. So it wasn't Reuben that he called to be um, the Levites, to be the priestly family. It wasn't Simeon. It was Levi. And so it's like, God, God, uh, did you make a mistake here? Wait wait a second. There's a couple other sons ahead of them. Um, Have you skipped over? Have you made a mistake? And God did not make a mistake there. So right here, God is pointing out something, I think, within the first little... um, 
few words of the genealogy that that God is is using this genealogy to 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 make a um, a theological connection, not just to give a genealogy because gene I don't think the genealogy is really full. I think he's cherry picking names because if you do if you add it all up, it, it doesn't work. It doesn't seem to work out to what you would what we would use a genealogy today uh, to kind of show the exact person after person after person. And, and I for think the, we for need the to record, kinda... I'm glad that Moses did not include everybody. I don't know that I could have gotten there... all the names. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a, bit, a, bit, a bit, a bit more. And I think God is using this for a, a purpose to point out, um, point out the theological significance and, and the significance of why he is touch pointing these people to bring Moses and Aaron back to their, um, back to the connection, back to Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob, Israel, and then connecting them to um, to Levi. And so I, I think that's part of it. And then we have uh, Gershon, uh, Koeth, and Maria, um, or Mariah. Um, and, uh, and they will come up again later on in your study of the Old Testament, because all th those three have different roles in um, in the uh, life of Israel with uh, the tabernacle and who's in charge of what and 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 those things. Um, so the the family line, not them, because they're with the Lord by now, uh, but um, their their lines. Um, and so I think that helps Moses and Aaron to know. Um, as we go forward, that God has, God has work for all the household of Israel, and and then here the household of Levi is going to have different work, and you two have different work. But in the end, God is in charge of the work. So the whole genealogy brings them back that God's in charge of the work. God's in charge of this line. God's in charge of you. God God is over all, and He can be trusted. Um, remember all of my promises and how he has brought these promises uh, to um, to this point in your life. Some interesting things that I've read in the commentaries. Uh, one commentator says that after this section, Moses and Aaron really no longer question God's power. Um, and mm -hmm. I, I don't know if I'm 100 percent on board with that, but I do like the idea that this genealogy, as you pointed out, connects them to God's history. And so this is Moses writing this down by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but partly also very likely a, a recognition. You know, it's it's a I'm going to sit down, and I'm going to figure this out, and yeah, you know, I this is what God is doing. So just a couple of things. Then in verse 15, it says uh, Sh uh, Shaul, the son of a Canaanite woman. These are the clans of Simeon. Um, Moses is probably putting their business out there a little bit. <laughs> you know, the last guy being this guy being mentioned that he's the son of a Canaanite woman probably mentioned because, well, there was some disapproval there. So that's sort of a, a in holy writ, a little whisper like, yeah, you remember that guy. He's the son of the Canaanite woman. Uh, but then we have uh, Yochabed, verse 20, which is uh, it's, it's Moses's mom, but also the first character in the scriptures whose name incorporates a divine name, Yahweh. Yochabed means Yahweh is glorious. Just some, some, some fun things from the commentary that I thought were interesting. So we have just a few minutes left in our program today, but at the very end, you know, verse 26, these are the Aaron and Moses to whom the Lord said, or to who Yahweh said, bring out the people of Israel from the land of Egypt by their host. And it was they who spoke to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, when, and I've asked this before, it must be a weird mindset that Moses is in to have to write this text by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but it's also about him. So he's making these connections, but he's connecting to the fact that what God is doing through him is part of God's overall plan in history. We have just one minute left. Uh, just leave us with a final note for the folks at home. Sure. As we began the chapter, we end the chapter. So I think that helps us because then by verse 30, uh, Moses uh, said to the Lord, Behold, I am of uncircumcised lips. How will Pharaoh listen to me? So to someone who said, well, uh, you know, right when he had this word, he, he no longer doubted anymore. I, I don't think it was immediate. 
um, because he's kind of going no. back to these struggles again, which helps us as we care for each other, right? That just because you've got a friend, a brother in Christ, a sister in Christ who has these doubts and struggles, then you bring them to the gospel and you're like, but I told you the gospel once. We, we need to continually hear the message of who God is, what God has done, and what he continues to promise to do for us. And yes, Moses is the one who will uh, be used to bring God's people out, but it's also speaking to us. Look at his weaknesses. God, God, it's, it's God. It's God who is doing all this. Um, and God has promised to us too. So if our brothers, sisters, family members, uh, the church, they don't hear the word and, and, and never doubt again, well, then, then they just need to join with the rest of us. Um, because we will continue to have these struggles until Christ yep. comes, but we have his promise to cling to, the promise of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks to my guest this morning, the Reverend John Shank, pastor of Trinity Lutheran Church in Edwardsville, Illinois. And folks, thank you too for joining us today. Be here same time tomorrow as we go with Moses back to Pharaoh and demand that he let God's people go. Predictably, Pharaoh refuses and God sends his first plague. So tune in to see how God shows his power over the gods of Egypt. And until then, may his peace and blessings be with you all as we pray. Father, keep us in thy strong word.